This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hey, welcome to my lunch hour. Stan Energy Man here, Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies on Think Tech Hawaii. Thanks for joining us this Friday, and uh, it's been a really, really busy week for all of us. And I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about a groundbreaking that happened on Wednesday with Surfco Pacific. It's the first hydrogen station commercially available to the public is, is gonna be uh, built in the next six or eight months uh, in an area called we call Mapuna Puna, which is down near the airport. And it's gonna be servicing the Marais that Toyota and Surfco bring in. Surfco is the Toyota dealership on the island of Oahu, uh, a very large Toyota dealership. And that'll bring Hawaii into the Marai and hydrogen market for sure. And uh, we're looking at it as the start of the future of hydrogen uh, and hydrogen economy and hydrogen civilization in Hawaii. So we're really excited. It was a great ceremony. The governor had a few great words to say. We got a little bit of press and uh, we're really happy. What I'd also like to do is, uh, well, last week we broadcast a Skype show and the, the sound was a little bit bad. Robert did as good a job as he could to clean up the Skype, but um, I hope it, hope it came across okay. But I've got some pictures here of the, uh, the vehicle and uh, some of the stuff that we did with the kids. So Robert, if we get up the first uh, image up. Um, this is the, the kids, that's um, Giorgio and Julia, Kylie and Leo. And I'm showing them all the parts to the kit uh, that helped us convert the vehicle. Next photo. And there's what it looked like all put together. I made the, the rack out of some maple and uh, it's been installed in the back of the vehicle there. So on the bottom is the fuel cell. Um, on the top is a control unit. On the very top is a not painted yet propane tank. We'll be putting hydrogen in. It's a really low pressure. And then a regulator attached to the outside of the frame there. And the next photo, we've got the team. Uh, we're missing Looks like Leo, I think he had to play tennis that day. But that's the team uh, with Rachel and I on top that we, we put this whole thing together with our guest today. We'll introduce in a few minutes, next, next photo. And this is what the finished product looked like. Uh, we've got 300 watts of PV on top and our millennium, our, I mean our, um, our, our fuel cell and tank and everything right in the back. And one more photo shows it kind of from the other direction. So this is an interesting photo because uh, we, I originally planned to have the, uh, that unit facing straight backwards and the kids said, no, why don't we face it sideways? Then we can have direct access to the control panel uh, from the side. And it also let us keep the, um, the brake light and our slow vehicle uh, placard there in view without having to move it around. So we're really excited. We've been driving the vehicle around and uh, right now it's out in the sunshine charging up with a solar panel. And that leads me into my guest today. I have as a guest Mike Strisky from New Jersey, who uh, was good enough to help uh, provide us with the conversion unit and help set it all up and make it easy for us by laboring, labeling all the connections and putting it together. So Mike, welcome to the show and uh, thanks for being on again. It's been an exciting week for us. I know it's been an exciting couple of months for you. Yeah, welcome. Uh, thanks a lot, Stan, for having me on the show. So what, yeah, what are you been up to? Yeah, a lot lately? of interesting projects going on. Yeah. Uh, are you able to hear me okay? Yep, we got you. Okay. So uh, the vehicle itself, that the uh, the kit that we shipped you guys were was basically uh, pretty much the same thing that we use on the, the hydrogen vehicles around my house here. We've used them for a long time to uh, plow snow with and uh, used them as a emergency ATUs. Uh, now that you have a vehicle that has a fuel cell and you've got stored energy above the battery, solar, you've got a moving power plant right now. Uh, this will this also ties into my uh, fuel box device, which will also be uh, very useful in uh, you know emergency emergency situations or any type of uh, uh, off-grid station. Well, I'm, I'm not exactly a survivalist or, or what they call as preppers, but I come really close for a Hawaiian guy. I've, I've got enough guns and ammo to get me through a, a pretty good amount of chaos. And uh, 
I'm really looking forward to maybe doing my house and one of my vehicles with one of these conversion kits too. Because I know that the, the same kind of uh, unit can be used to make uh, a pretty decent uninterruptible power supply in the house, correct? Yeah, uh, currently we went public uh, a um, couple of months ago uh, doing hydrogen home using uh, fuel cell technology, ultra capacitors, grid tie inverters, battery, uh, the whole combination. Uh, you know, you have more than one power source. So you're able to store your energy well and above the small battery that's in the unit. Um, you know, the big nuclear ball comes up in the sky every single day. And if you can store that energy both seasonally and on a daily basis, you know, you're ensuring your, your, uh, your, your own local grid indefinitely. I've been through many hurricanes here at the hydrogen house. We've had ter terrible winter norether nor'easters, and uh, you know we had one a couple weeks ago where we had a microburst that took power out of the neighborhood for almost four days. And the beauty of it is, after about day six around here, everybody's generators run dead, and they're all ending up in my house, running that cup of coffee, uh, charging their cell phone, or uh, you know looking for a hot meal. So, uh, you know. They were laughing at me in the beginning, but nobody's laughing anymore. I know how that is. I've been called Noah in my neighborhood because I built a big boat out of in my garage in my driveway. And then when I started bringing home fish, they quit laughing at me and I started giving people fish. <laughs> but I hear what you're saying and uh, and that's how I feel about the whole hydrogen thing. Um, you know, I look at how we've, we've kind of divested ourselves of our own responsibility for our own energy. And we've let the electric company basically just take it over and we just pay the bill. Maybe that's because by nature we're a little bit lazy. But uh, since I've been doing more detailed work with the folks like you and Paul from the Big Island and, and Chris McWinney from Dayton and, uh, you know, uh, Mitch Ewan from up at the university and all the folks up there, I, I've just come to get a different appreciation for energy overall and how really it's kind of fun to, to be able to make your own power and store your own energy and and um, not have to depend on other folks for it. And I know that's the life you live. So, you know, one of the interesting things that I'm seeing in the energy world, I'm pretty in tune with it, as I do a lot of my work in California, where a lot of the place is that we're now in the process of turning over to the next evolution. Started out with horse and buggy, uh, now, now we had a fossil fuel age and now over to the hydrogen. So now you have all these oil companies you know, looking square in the eyes of uh, change. And if they don't adapt, they're going to end up like the dinosaurs that they uh, pull out of the ground. So, you know, right now the oil companies are blockbuster in the Netflix world. So they're going to have to learn to adapt, you know, or they're going to be left behind. And right now, you know, there's, the, the cost benefits of doing this are so much greater than that of oil. You're looking at something that, uh, you know, you can store renewable energy indefinitely. There's no shelf life. There's no wheels to well. Uh, you have all the advantages of not putting anything into the environment, 100% recyclable. You don't have to protect this coming over from the Somali pirates, and you don't get the huge line losses, uh, you know, transporting it over the wires. So there's a lot of reasons that this is making a lot more economic sense. Um, you know, the automakers, Toyota, Honda, are all scrambling right now, you know, to get their piece of this new economy, as well as people building the equipment. You don't need a trillion dollar infrastructure to put in hydrogen stations. Um, exactly. And the nice that's thing about I, it is the, uh, the hydrogen stations, you're never going to have an oil spill leak. Exactly. You know, the DEP or EPA aren't going to come knocking on the door. Yeah, I did a and couple of things when we safer. first started our station. I, I, um, I, I told the, the guy that was running the station, I said, I, I think I'm going to talk to the newspaper and say, we had this massive hydrogen leak at Hickam and nothing happened. You know, because if you had a leak at any other kind of gas station, it'd be a disaster. But every, hydrogen is just going to go straight up and help you make some more clouds or something. Another thing, too, like you say, is uh, I show people the footprint of our gas station at Hickam, our hydrogen station. And the production, storage, dispensing, and everything is in the footprint of a gas station, a regular gas station. 
but that's your oil field, your oil um, pipeline, your oil tanker, their oil refinery, and the tanker truck that brings the fuel to your station is all in a 20-foot container behind the wall. And it's like, how elegant can you get? Yeah, the, um, if anybody wants to see hydrogen refueling for the new Mirai, I have it on my website. There are a number of links. It's hydrogenhouseproject.org. And, uh, you know, these, these vehicles refuel in, you know, three to five minutes, unlike a Tesla that takes you hours. You know, the other good thing about, about hydrogen vehicles is that they don't generate 4,000 pounds of uh, battery waste that can't be recycled at the end of life. So lithium ion battery, the Teslas are lasting about five years. Um, they yep. create scorched earth when you start by mining up the uh, lithium. They create scorched earth when you stop by having to dispose of a 4,000 pound um, anchor that you can't recycle. Yep. Hydrogen has neither of those problems. So, I should, I should probably know, know this, but what's the cost of a set of Tesla batteries if you have to swap them out? They're about 50 grand. 50 grand. That's the cost of the Mirai. Yeah. Well, speaking of the Mirai, I hear you just got one. So how do you like it? Uh, I love it. <laughs> it's an awesome vehicle. I mean, the fact that I can travel 330 miles on the equivalent of four gallons of gasoline is pretty amazing. That's you know, even though they're charging $16 a kilogram, it's still equivalent with gasoline because of the efficiency of the fuel cell engine. And then, it, you know, I get a real kick out of, uh, you know, pushing the button in the car and uh, putting my cup under and getting a drink of water. <laughs> yeah, they, they call that the P demonstration. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, it beats wrapping your lips around that big fat tailpipe. <laughs> exactly. Anyway. And you can so people don't realize it. as long as you have a full tank of hydrogen in the car, you can get out about uh, about nine gallons of water. So if you're in a desert, that's a pretty good deal. I tell you what, you know who's really interested in that kind of thing is uh, we had a conference here about two weeks ago called Verge, and it was put on by the U.S. Pacific Command. And so we had a lot of military folks here. And you know when it comes to that kind of concept where you, you're storing energy in hydrogen, using it in your equipment, but guess what? You get to collect some of that water back, and that's a precious resource when you're deployed overseas, especially in a desert, but in almost any environment in the military, you know, the less you have to carry around with you, the better. And so if you're making your own water you know, at your, at your base camp, that's a, that's a big plus. That's one of the big pluses we sell to the military. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's in a lot of things. That now that General Motors has replaced the Hummer with the Colorado fuel cell pickup, you know, it doubles as an APU unit where they can go out and they can use it as a power plant. Um, in addition to that, there's no heat signature. So, you know, you're not going to have that heat seeking missile going down looking for a tailpipe because it won't find one. Yeah, no heat signature and very little noise. So even when you're trying to sneak around, the, the vehicle is dead quiet. This is the shape of things to come. I mean, all of the signs are pointing in this direction. I mean, if you look at what Wall Street is doing, Amazon just bought 25% of plug power. You know, that's a big thumbs up, you know, despite what Elon Musk uh, calls uh, fuel cells, fuel cells. Um, but you know, we also have see large companies like Heister, which is the yeah. largest material handling company in the world, uh, just bought Nuvera fuel cell to start to get into this game. So a lot of the players are all consolidating now. The forklift business is going to kick this thing off as far as the refueling stations go. And, you know, the automakers are going to be right behind, you know, and I'm doing the house end. So you now have fuel cells for homes, for forklifts, construction equipment, things like that. And, uh, you know, vehicles. Toyota is now doing 100% uh, participating in the 100% electric port over at uh, Long Beach where they're uh, debuting their hydrogen fuel cell trucks. So you're looking at three of the same units that are in the Mirai in a truck. They're doing a full-size uh, bus that they're doing with two of those units, and then obviously one in the Mirai. So the, the, the big news coming up, why this is all going to happen, is because uh, over the last couple of weeks, there have been some announcements from General Motors and from uh, Honda that they've cracked the code in using non-precious metals in fuel cells. Now, how big is that? Well, that's really big because most of the cost in the fuel cell is the rare earth metals. 
So if you're going to metals like uh, cobalt, vanadium, uh, you know, these, these are a lot cheaper. Nickel are a lot cheaper catalysts than you would have normally if you were using platinum. Uh, now, even though the catalysts are not as effective, the substrates have gotten a lot better. So the little known invention called graphene, basically you can coat large cross-sectional areas that are very strong that, you know, are only atoms thick. So now you can make a fuel cell, a 10 kilowatt fuel cell, the size of a, uh, of a um, let's say, call it a lunchbox. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's the whole thing there, Mike. It's all about surface area. And when you get down to one atom thickness on your surface area, you can make a lot of surface area. That's the key in nature, too, for photosynthesis and everything. We're coming up on a break here. We're going to take a 60-second break, and we'll be back with Mike Stritsky shortly. My friend, mother, what big eyes you have, she said. All the better to see you with, my dear. What are you doing? Okay, cool. Research says reading from birth accelerates the baby's brain development. And you're doing that now? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the starting line. Push. Uh, when this is over, you're dead. Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour. Stan, the energy man here with Mike Strisky all the way from New Jersey via Skype. And we were just talking about uh, the hydrogen revolution that's really just starting to kick off. And, you know, most of you aren't seeing it yet because you're not looking for it. But Mike and I live it and we see it happening every day all around us. And it's, it's starting to pick up like a snowball and start rolling down that hill. And uh, you, you're going to see hydrogen happening. And so, Mike, welcome back. And... Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about some of your plans and what you're working on? I know you've got other plans besides driving that Mariah around. Can you talk at all about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, right now, Toyota has one of the uh, most inexpensive fuel cells on the market. You know, so that means that uh, you know, we're going to be able to utilize a lot of these fuel cells now uh, for power applications that are going to be much less expensive than you can buy conventional. So I see a lot of these vehicle to grid projects where they're going to make a huge difference, um, you know, in uh, adding utility to the vehicle. So you'll be able to drive up to a, uh, you know, a traffic signal intersection, a construction site, a wedding or a cabin in the woods, and you'll be able to power with your vehicle. So, you know, these are some of the things we're looking at. Uh, you know, everything since hydrogen is 80 percent of every molecule in the universe. You know, the sources of fuel are unlimited. And people don't realize that one of the biggest sources, um, you know, obviously being water, but is sewage. Um, you have the Japanese right now extracting um, sewage, uh, hydrogen from sewage. So that is enormous. So you're able to power half a million cars, you know, on sewage. Right now, currently, they're using a technology where they're uh, doing... Uh, uh, anaerobic digestion and then steam reformation to get the hydrogen but you know we figured out a way to do it where we can leave the uh, the carbon in the paste and we generate no methane so that's one of the top secret projects that we're working on um, it's no longer top secret know, mike pardon me it's no longer top just between secret. just between me you and your <laughs> listeners <laughs> well all six of my listeners will, will be all yes. over it um but a lot of the projects I'm involving right now either have something to do with water or hydrogen, which is the essence of all life. You know, we have in front of us right now the greatest, you know, technology ever presented to man. And all we have to do is, you know, open up the keys to the cage and let ourselves out of it. Um, what's happening now is, you know, we have units like these small fuel cells here. Once you put them in the hands of the consumer, they're going to start to demand it. And that's what's happening now. It's like the cell phones. They're not going to be able to stop this technology 
because the, the technology is going to be demanded by the consumer and capitalism is going to flood in from everywhere. You know, the originally AT&T and Verizon and all these people who own the landlines didn't want to see cell phones. All right. So they did whatever they could to stop them. Then, you know, they started becoming so popular they couldn't ignore it anymore. So what's the old saying? If you can't beat them, join them. So, so all of this is all is all starting to snowball right now. Um, no one's laughing at hydrogen anymore, except for maybe Elon Musk. But um, a lot of people now know that this is this is real. It's the way to go, and it's safer than any fuel we already know. So if we're you know think about it, it my energy system here at the hydrogen home creates only pure oxygen only pure water, a little bit of heat and electricity. And, you know, people seem to think that I consume water. I don't consume water. All I do is convert it. It starts as water. It ends as water. Power of the sun does the conversion. There's no wheels to well, you know, the, and it's delivered free to my house every day. So this, it really is the ultimate power source. You know, we lose about up to 80% of the energy over the electric lines just because you've got to go through all those all those capacitors and lines and uh, switching stations and everything else, that no one takes that into account. I know in Hawaii right now, the reason for adopting technologies like we're generating today is because you know the utility company now says we're not going to be friendly to solar anymore. We we did away with all the grid tie, so that means if I give the grid a kilowatt hour, they don't give it back to me. So you're all, you know, all these people that had solar systems now, you know, can now have to pay for electricity and they're giving it to the utility for free. Thank you very much. So, uh, you know, you, you talk about that, uh, that, that be free or die mentality. This technology, you know, keeps you from the mask and gun. Um, you know, if you truly want to be free, you've got to generate your own power, your own water. You've got to take care of your own communications and food. Then you truly are independent. And this, you know, I've got two of the four. So the, the technology there, you know, will set you free. Um, you know, yeah, it's expensive now, but so were big screen TVs. So were laptops and so were cell phones in the beginning. But the technology is going to get a lot cheaper. It's going to get a lot more useful. And it's going to be in every part of life. I mean, I started out um, with these small fuel cells making... Uh, uh, basically batteries for the uh, for the military. So instead of leaving a ton of batteries, you screw three cylinders and a helmet. You know, and you power the the whole hard drive on the on the helmet. So hey, tell us, talk to it, us a little bit about somewhere. that because that technology with those uh, in that little unit that you show the small fuel cell with those are metal hydride storage containers, correct? Yeah, right here you can see them. Yeah, these are aircraft legal. You can't take bottled water on an airplane. But I can take a hydrogen fuel cell with 14 liters of hydrogen in a little tank that has 400 pounds in it. Okay, so this is safer than bottled water in the eyes of the FAA. And I take these all around the world. So most people take the, the battery powered chargers and I take a hydrogen fuel cell. They have to go look for a plug when theirs is dead. I just re reach into my bag. I grab another cylinder. I screw it in and I'm done. And this thing will run a LED flashlight for two weeks. So all this stuff can be miniaturized. It can be scaled up or scaled down. And it's all happening right now. Yeah, more and more people are going to get into this business as um, it starts to grow. And when you look at the restrictions on lithium uh, batteries, even, the, and, you know, everybody's familiar with the, what is the iPhone 7 or whatever they've got that... Uh, they won't let you take on the, the airplane that was anymore. The Samsung, yeah. Yeah, the Samsung. But even if you were a construction worker and you're taking your tools like we do here in the, to the neighbor islands, um, if you have spare lithium batteries in your check baggage, they don't want those in there either. And uh, I, I've got some through one time because I, I convinced the, the ticket agent that I had the safety caps on the lithium batteries. But, man, if they find out you've got lithium batteries in your check baggage, they'll boot those things off in a heartbeat too. Well, they had all those hoverboards catch fire as well. Those exactly. are all banned as well. well These are I mean, high energy sources. And uh, a lot of things can go wrong. 
Well, it's one you of know, those things where the good news about lithium is it's it's got so much you know power and stuff and it and it it does so well, but you it comes at a price and the price is safety. And uh, once you have a lithium fire started, good luck trying to put it out because you throw water on it, it makes it burn better. So uh, it's not a good thing. I think the other thing from a security standpoint is we own nothing, none of the lithium. It's owned by South America and China. Exactly. And I'm sure China owns most of the stuff that's in South America because they probably already bought it because they look ahead on these kind of things. Yeah, you're right. So, so when, we talk, when we talk about energy security, you know, and we talk about where do you get your fuel from, um, hydrogen is the answer because it's, it's all the way around. I mean, nobody controls, like you say, that, that big hydrogen ball in the sky. And the sunlight knows no boundaries on any country that I know of except maybe Antarctica and the Arctic uh, a couple months out of the year. So as long as you've got sun shining and wind blowing, you know, you've got free energy you know, right in your, in your backyard. You should be taking advantage of it. Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, the nice thing is, is this stuff is storable indefinitely. You know, it's as good today as it will be for 100 million years from now. So, you know, this, the cycle of the hydrogen house here is I make all my energy in the spring when I have no heat or air conditioning loads. So my 27 kilowatts goes into my electrolyzer that fills my 12 1,000 gallon storage tanks. Each one of those storage tanks holds the equivalent of about six gallons of propane or about five gallons of gasoline. But when all of those together, all of those 12 tanks together, that's enough to power my house for 90 days. So I've got a lot of storage here, and that includes cooking gas, heating gas, and fuel for the car. Um, so that's the total energy picture. Uh, being able to store that energy seasonally means whenever it's available, I can store it. In Hawaii, you're blowing out 12 gigawatts worth of power from wind that you'll never see again. In California right now, they're taking that, they're, they're actually done too good a job with renewables, and now... They are paying Arizona to take their power. <laughs> they can basically that. turn this all into hydrogen and power the whole infrastructure. Exactly. You know, I'll drag my trailer out to the desert, you know, set up an electrolyzer, fill it up, drive it back, and, you know, power some forklifts or some well, Mirais. Well, one of the things that Hawaii has over most of the other states is that um, we figured out real early, because we have a high penetration of renewable energy and solar in our state, as you mentioned, the electric company doesn't even want to help you anymore, that um, we figured out that storing energy is a big part of this equation. And batteries, especially on a large scale, aren't the best way to store that energy. So we're breaking the code early out here that if, uh, if you really want to go down this road, hydrogen is a great way to store energy. And no better example than the hydrogen house over there in New Jersey. So, so Well, uh, just to let you know, we're going to be doing a hydrogen house in Hilo. So that'll be one of the next ones we're doing. Great. Well, I've keep got us... about five scheduled we're building around the country. Okay. Well, keep us posted on that. And uh, we'll go over and do a Skype show from Hilo back here to the studio and show everybody how that looks. And believe it or not, Mike, we're, we're up against our hard stop half hour. And uh, I'd like to thank you for being on again. And we'll have you on again soon, uh, probably before you do the Hilo project. But uh, if not, at least by then. So thanks for being on with us, Mike, and I uh, look forward to talking to you again. Yeah, you have to get out here and see the place sometime. Okay, we will do. Well, All thanks, right. everybody, for watching this today. I thank you for uh, tuning in to Think Tech Hawaii, and uh, make sure if you have any comments, you send them in. Thanks to Cindy Monofkai and for to Robert Mc, uh, McLean for uh, putting the show together for us here in the studio. And I'm Stan Energy Man. We'll see you next week, Friday. Aloha.